Let's do this. Subscribe to the channel. Ah, ah. That's the 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 Alright y'all, nigga, throw it in there, y'all see the title, and today we got a request, man, and it's a new subscriber, man, y'all already know, man, and this is how to be how we, an abyss, how to be the abyss, and may in the, and made an abyss, y'all already know, man, if y'all saw it, you understand it, if you know it, you know it, we already know, how your day been, you been swell, you already know, I'm here for work, I want to see how they gonna break it down, so you already know, link up in the description below, like, subscribe, what I'm gonna do, so, no more slogan, no more slogan, no more slogan, I'm the greatest, I know I am. I got the... You found out your dead mother was alive and deep within the Earth's core. What would you do? You will have to journey to the center of the Earth, where everything and anything will try to kill you. I'm going to break down. I ain't no way I'm winning with the monster. Down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the abyss itself in Made in Abyss. This little girl is about to go through literal hell in order to find her mother. Rico here is not your average little girl. She is a part of a group called the Red Whistle Orphan Explorers. They're trained from a young age to venture down deep within the Earth's core, a place known worldwide as the Abyss. First of all, I wouldn't be going in now. Uh, I'm just not built for that. Rico has no idea that this unknown and barely explored deep hole will cost her everything she loves. Rico and her friend are searching for lost relics near the surface of the abyss, when all of a sudden her friend gets discovered by a horrifying crimson split jaw worm that is about to devour her friend right in front of Rico's eyes. Rico, looking on in sheer terror, acts quickly by blowing on her red whistle to get the absolutely ginormous worm's attention, but it's at that moment that she instantly regrets her decision and I ain't gonna lie boy i wouldn't even do it i wouldn't even do it well i probably would if i was like hiding somewhere and then like blow it i'm just saying gets tail whipped by the worm down a shaft only to have to continue running for her sweet life and the monster is gaining on her and is about to devour her flesh when all of a sudden a huge blast is emitted right in front of Rico's eyes causing the worm to fly away well that's just great that's a crimson split jaw worm that is a type of carnivorous scarlet red reptile species Look like a snake that lives mainly in the third layer of the abyss. The mm. fact that we saw it here is insane and super rare. And let's be honest, there's no way that we can beat this beast because uh, we're just 12 years old in pigtails. But part of this beast's diet does include ancient artifacts and ruins. And we noticed that that monster ate that kid's backpack full of treasures before it tried to attack him. And we've got a whole buffet full of artifacts right in our bag. So if I was Rico, I would gracefully let our friend get torn to shreds Sorry, but that hey, yeah, what it is. Hey, like I said, I'll probably blow the whistle like somewhere over there, like in a corner somewhere. Hey, like I said, yeah, what it is, bro. Yeah, what it is. It would have been. That wouldn't have left us out of the woods just yet. The only way to get rid of this thing for good would have been to throw our bag full of artifacts away from where we are, while also retaining one or two in our hands, just in case. The noise of the bag dropping in the distance would have gotten the split jaw's attention, and we, as a result, could have circled around the split jaw, heading back into the cave right near where our friend was discovered. Realistically, we could not have outrun this monster for long. So yeah, okay, too bad, bro. That thing be too fast. So our best bet would like a snake and a cunt. Would have been to hide within that small cave, since it is unlikely that the split jaw could fit through there. The remaining few artifacts in our hand could have been used as a means of distraction in case the worm caught onto our plants before we could have reached the cave. Rico looks around in confusion and notices burn marks on the nearby trees. Whatever that mysterious beam was, was something truly powerful and highly useful if we can get it. Rico then notices a pendant, but not before. She spots a young boy near her age passed out nearby, with his hands glowing bright red. Rico sees that this boy is nothing short of extraordinary and discovers that he's not a boy at all, but a robot. Rico wonders where in the hell did this strange robot come from? Back at the orphanage that Rico lives in, she begs her climbing teacher to let her go further into the abyss, wanting to catch up with her. I ain't gonna lie, I like that helmet though. 
her mother, who disappeared years back somewhere within the abyss. But she wolf. doesn't realize that she'll soon get everything that she ever wanted and much more. Later, Rico and her friends finally manage to wake up the robot boy, who doesn't even remember that he is a robot, nor what his special powers are, and who cannot even remember where he came from. Rico ends up calling him Reg and begins showing him around the town, suspecting that he came from within the abyss, since duh, she found him in it. Over time, she and her friends secretly make him a part of the orphanage, and he learns to live the ways of Red Whistle explorers. Until one fateful day changes everything for him and Rico. A lift comes floating up out of the abyss, and out comes trusted family friend of Rico called Beard Guy, who announces that they found the white whistle of the town's top explorer, who turns out to belong to Rico's long lost mother. The town celebrates the return of Rico's mother's whistle, and a big ceremony is given in her honor. This is where Rico finds out that she was born from within the abyss, and that her bad eyesight and glasses are direct result of the curse of the abyss. Since there she was born inside it. My thing is, I was just like, who? So who? Who? You know what I'm saying? Who she? Who? Who her mother made? You know, in, entanglement with. I'm just saying. I, I don't know. That's part that got me is nothing actually medically wrong with her eyesight. Rico also finds out that her mother went on a long, treacherous journey to the center of the abyss, resulting in every one of her teammates dying except for one person. All the while being pregnant and giving birth down in the abyss, bringing Rico- Yeah, see, I was trying to see who is that? Who the, who the dual is? Rico back up as a baby from the depths of the abyss in a curse-repelling vessel. Rico's mm. teacher over here also says that ascending from the fourth layer of the abyss is unbearable, even for adults. With Rico herself only making it back alive as a baby, thanks to the vessel her mother and the one surviving member of her squad put her in. Okay, this is insane. If I was Rico, I'd focus less of my time on climbing and more time on studying the myths and legends and history history associated with the curse of the abyss. Because if my eyesight was affected enough by the curse to cause an eyesight impediment for life, then I'd personally want to know if the curse gave or took anything else from me. And I would use everything that I can from all known realms of science or otherwise. I'd also ask around if anyone has ever looked into formulating a suit made of the materials that a curse repelling vessel is made of. Because it's clear that in order to go into the abyss, we're going to need some help. And right now, the only thing they gave us an edge over anyone else is the fact that we have a strange artifact from the abyss itself. That robot boy that we met, Reg. I'd also get some help from some trusted, knowledgeable friends and anyone that we can find to begin examining Reg ASAP. Because if Reg came from the abyss, that means he must know how to handle it, subconsciously or otherwise. Later, Rico is given permission to review the lost contents found within her mother's belongings, where inside she sees in-depth guides on various undiscovered relics and animals found deep within the cave. And it's here that she sees a drawing that looks just like the robot kid Reg. And that's when Rico discovers something insane. She finds a note from her mother saying that she'll be at the bottom of the abyss waiting. Rico then loses her shit because obviously mom's calling and plans to go find her mother, who now she thinks is actually alive and calling for her. Rico prepares for the most dangerous and terrifying oh, journey that she will ever take and is warned by her high-ranking peers that this journey to the bottom of the abyss is too dangerous to go. Rico decides to go anyway and Reg also agrees to go with her, wanting to go down with her to find out just exactly where he comes Amazing strength comes from, and claiming that he will protect Rico with his life. Rico's classmates then plan out the route, with this glasses guy bringing out a map of the Abyss's six-layered netherworld, which shows everything of the Abyss that has up until now been mapped out, with the first layer being 1300 meters down, which is where they'll encounter terrifying beasts from the second layer coming up to greet them, as they themselves come looking for prey. The second- I've been so curious, I've been waiting for them to go down and see all the other monsters, bro. I'm, I'm that meat. The second layer will be when the strain of ascending is said to become too difficult for most people to bear, and is past the limit where any help from the surface will be sent, treating the second layer and everything else past that as a suicide mission. The end of the second layer will be when the immense unstable air currents and savage monsters of unknown origin will begin to appear. The third layer will possess an immense vertical cliff, over 4,000 meters, which they'll need to traverse, with the fourth layer being only meant for high-ranking black and 
and White Whistle Explorers 7,000 meters below. The fifth layer known as the Sea of Corpses being White Whistle exclusive territory, with less than five White Whistle Explorers ever returning from those depths. And finally, the sixth layer from which no White Whistle has ever returned from. That is where true terror will await them in the abyss. Okay, first off, I like fame and glory as much as the next girl, but the fact that you're willing to go down there unprepared just off Listen. of an old note from your mother is so stupid. We have no idea when this note was made, so first I'd make a case for us to begin examining the note and ink from the paper it was written on. The chemical mm. analysis of writing and printing inks and matching them together can be invaluable when trying to prove whether a document is fraudulent or not. And in this case, I wouldn't risk my life for my mother unless someone can prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was written by my mother and written by her <laughs> recently. And we can do this by the process of ink dating. Ink dating is a highly mm. specialized forensic examination to determine the age Ooh. of the ink and can be formulated to identify a specific. Hey man, I like this thought. I like stuff like this. So they think so beyond it. Fascinating manufacturer to ascertain the first date of commercial availability and the chemical solvents within the ink that evaporate over time can be found and traced through a technique known as gas chromatography and or mass spectrometry to determine if the written document was created within a specific period of time and if this puny little town didn't have access to such things then I begin sending that bad boy overseas to a forensic laboratory first because you heard what awaits us down in the abyss a uh, certain doom so we need to make sure that we don't go down the purely on a whim or a hunch because I love my mom but I don't know if I love her that much. The big day of their horrifying adventure has now come and the duo sneaks past everyone and finds another way down into the abyss. They say their goodbyes to their friends and descend down into the blackened depths below. And this is where all the fun is about to begin. Rico and Reg reach the first lair but get lost along the way with the depth gauge indicating that they are 820 meters below sea level. Rico mm. then runs runs off to get a better vantage point, witnessing the first layer of the abyss in all of its terrifying glory. Rico thinks this means that at this speed, they'll make it to the bottom of the abyss in no time at all. Reg and Rico stop to make breakfast for the day, while Reg gives Rico an envelope. It's her mother's sealed letters. Rico grabs a red slip from the book written in her mother's handwriting saying, I'll depart at dawn to come capture you. This freaks Rico out as she thinks they're running late to meet her mother, and because of this, they quit quickly clear out and begin to descend even further down into the abyss. But that's when they run into a silk Oak fang. Reg quickly shoots his robotic arm at the spider as they make a jump for it, barely escaping with their lives. This is a silk fang. A very thought I was a, uh, like a scorpion. Look like it. Very common large insect found within the first layer of the abyss. This bad boy is known for paralyzing poison that it spits from its mouth. Reg did well, but failed to spot the warning signs earlier that could have prevented such a thing from ever happening to begin with. These creatures are territorial after all, and unlike the split jaw worm, they won't attack you unless you enter their territory. Rico and Reg should have oh. noticed the warning signs around them in the form of passing through a 10 meter dome shaped territory, which marks the zone where a silk fang would be present to begin with. This creature rarely if ever leaves its dome and frankly they could have completely ignored stepping into their territory to begin with if they just kept a better lookout than just yeah they walk around it pretty much. Sending willy nilly not knowing what's happening. Rico and Reg head further in but Rico is already feeling the effects of the harsh abyss. Feeling lethargic and slightly weak as they march further on into the depths. Rico and Reg then take a break but that's when they hear a distinct noise coming from within the bushes. It could be a search party that's after them so the duo runs off at full speed knowing that if they are caught they will be forced to ascend back up to the top and away from Rico's mother. But that's when a huge burly man plunges down right in front of them. It's Beard Guy, but luckily for them, he's not there to capture them. Thanks to Rico's friends, they manage to convince Beard Guy to come see them off before they reach the second lair. He then gives Rico some supplies, such as food and a vaccine vial meant to help protect her from the effects of the abyss the further down she goes. He also tells them of the white whistle who helped Rico's mom bring Rico to the surface as a baby, Ozen the Immovable, an expert white whistle explorer who is active deep within the depths of the abyss. Beard Beard Guy then bids them farewell and Rico and Reg descend further into the mysterious depths of this never-ending void. Okay, this is insanely stupid. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, 
I would not let them a kid, but I understand I'll probably wait. Leave, wait till she leave here at 15. They shouldn't have just let their only aide leave them so soon. Despite this guy looking like Harry Potter's shaggy uncle who knows everything and is also knowing everything about this place, and he's a black whistle explorer, which is the second most experienced position besides a expert mountaineer white whistle. I would have done mm. everything I can to bow him tighter to us than a Wellington dinner, because this piece of shit isn't leaving my sight. Now, as rookie climbers, we have already studied the theory of the abyss and all it contains, but practical experience is a whole different thing than just just a mere theory. And Beard Guy is ripe with practical advice and wisdom that he can give to us. Remember, we're just a couple of snotty 12 year olds, we don't know shit. First off, I want more information about this Ozen the Immovable character, and if she is someone I need to worry about. I'd also ask more about the third and fifth layers of the abyss, because the fourth layer will contain that 4000 meter vertical cliff, and the fifth will only be where a few whistles have ever returned from. This will make scaling down such areas exponentially more difficult compared to the second layer. Rico and Reg are still taking this journey way too carefree, and this will cost them. The scenery changes as the duo descend. Hang on, that would make me mad, bro, because, like, I'm like, come on, man. But I understand they kids, and he's a robot, though, so, like, a cyborg war robot, bro further, reaching an eerie bit of grassland surrounded by a sinister looking forest. They just reached the second layer of the abyss. Rico jumps up and down in excitement while Reg looks more concerned, knowing the harsh realities of the situation. After this point, no one will come for them. They will be all alone. Rico and Reg decide to head to the seeker camp located near there, but it's at this moment that they hear a voice, and it's crying out for help. They run at full speed, getting closer to the pleas of what seems to be someone in trouble. But in the abyss, nothing is as it seems. Yeah, I'm saying that, that's... Uh, they come across the source of the cries for help, which turns out to be coming from a... That's a bait, man. You've been lured to a bait, man. If I hear someone yelling, I, I'm not even going to invest, God. No one ain't supposed to be down here. Let me mess up strange creature of some sort as it feeds on the corpse of a dead cave raider. It's a corpse weeper and Reg prepares to kill it, but Rico knows something is up and thinks it's a trap. And she's right, as another corpse weeper comes diving down straight for Rico, plucking her from the surface and ascending high up into the sky. Reg tries to act fast and aim his robotic arm, but it's deflected by another corpse weeper. He mm. tries again, but the same thing happens. These creatures know his every move and they attack Reg with full force striking terror at the very heart of his robotic soul. He's running out of time. He decides to turn on his massive beam gun, the same weapon that saved Rico at the very beginning, knowing that if he misses, his weapon could kill Rico. Reg unleashes the full force of his mighty unknown powers as he fires his raging blast straight at the corpse weeper. Hang on, I like that blast. I like that blast, though, man. That thing hard. <laughs> lighting up the sky fiery red, forcing all the creatures to fly away and freeing Rico with Reg having to save her before she comes crashing down. That, my good weebs, is a very large bird that lives within the second layer of the abyss. And this is why children aren't allowed to go down to these areas because Rico and Reg were way too naive for their own good, rushing off to the cries of help without any thought put behind it first. If we noticed during the second or third cry from the mysterious voice right before they found the source, the sound of the cries for help sounded almost raspy, with almost a alien-like inflection in the sound of the voice, much like the predator species when it tries to mimic its prey. At first glimpse of the corpse weeper, Rico and Reg should have considered this person to be already dead, even if he wasn't, because Rico is familiar with what this species is, and should have known from the very first sighting that this species of bird always hunts in packs, especially during breeding season, and often drives prey towards their colony to hunt them together. Upon first glance, Rico and Reg should have run away from them, using the cover of trees as a defense against being picked off by these corpse weepers from the air. Worst case, I would have stayed under the cover of forest and trees, forcing any nearby corpse weepers to try and attack me within close proximity and from the ground. This way, Reg could have subdued their wings from close range, and Rico could have aided in blinding them. The corpse weepers' reliance on their superb spatial awareness was the only weak point that we could have realistically harmed if we got them close enough to us first. Yet again, Rico is overzealous with joy and naive as to the harsh realities of the abyss, but tells Reg that she can help Reg train to use his powers more effectively. But suddenly, a wave of sleepiness comes over him, forcing No, every time he use his power, he just, he gotta collapse. 
We gotta race. ...him to pass out. Mm. Rake suddenly wakes up after a terrifying dream, finding out that he's been asleep for two hours and that Rico has lost her notebook. The duo continues on with their journey, reaching further into the dark entranceways into the abyss, finally reaching the point where everything in the abyss is upside down. Even the waterfalls, with crazy winds forcing Rake to not use his grappling hand. Looks like they're gonna have to start climbing the normal way from here on out. No more shortcuts for them. The two then discover strange alien-like monkeys who throw things at them, which force them to run, but the harsh winds cause them to crash hard. Looks like this journey's gonna be a lot harder than they thought. They continue on and eventually reach the Seeker Camp, a place where the force field of the abyss is weaker and the atmosphere is not as violent. The Seeker Camp has a telescope to monitor any and all activity around the area. Rico and Rake approach the sinister-looking camp, sitting in the midst of all the trees, but the lift is not working. So Rake shoots his retractable hands to send them up, but is suddenly grabbed by a pair of blacked gloved hands. But these hands are no ordinary hands. They belong to the famous white whistle Ozen the Immovable. Sending the lift down the shaft, the duo then heads up, not knowing what awaits them at the top of this scary looking place. Here they meet one of the most famous white whistles of all time, and she recognizes who Rico is. Ozen the Immovable towers over the two kids and invites them into her place. Rico then shows Ozen her mother's note, telling her that this is the reason they came here. But Ozen then just walks away, saying that they can rest here for a while, and she leaves the room. The gang gets some rest and meets up with Ozen's assistant, blue-haired girl, who shows them around the place. But it is here that Ozen meets them again and reveals that the note with Rico's mother's handwriting is not actually written by her mother. Ozen tells mm. Rico that her journey is over and that her mother is actually dead, as is evident by her white whistle. To top off the shocking news, Ozen says that she's also found Rico's mother's letters at her gravesite deep below the abyss, meaning that Rico's mother is actually dead. What did I tell you? Did I not say that I was skeptical that Rico's mother's handwriting was real? Come on now. If I'm Rico, I would believe Ozen from the get-go and call it quits right here and now, and then go on a sweet relic hunt before heading back up to my town. We have no idea what's further down below other than near certain death. I'd also beg Ozen to give us free training lessons and start by inspecting Rag thoroughly. He is probably the most powerful being in this world, and up until now, Rico has not spent much time in figuring out just what he is truly capable of. She needs to stop treating him like a friend and more like a lethal weapon. The For real. What I've been doing. Max depth of the abyss that we know of is between 13,000 to 15,000 meters deep. In comparison to the tallest mountain in our world, Mount Everest is 8,849 meters. This dang hole is bigger in size than Mount Everest. If our mother was alive, I'm pretty sure she would want us to save ourselves, especially if we're a little girl that's about to risk our lives on a hunch. Ozen then leads the shocked duo into her chambers, where they see this massive, wondrous white box. A relic so unique that it's not even in the relic guidebook. One that Rico's mother brought along. It's the curse repelling vessel. It's a relic designed to prevent any of the side effects that one would get if they ascended from the abyss. It was made to help creatures who are unable to make the trip back to the surface. But Ozen says that the relic also did something else amazing. That whatever contents were placed inside the box would begin to be embellished with life. Rico then finds out that she was born stillborn and that it was only when her her corpse was placed inside the relic that she came back to life. Ozen also tells Reiko in a twist that she actually despises her and tells her that she is nothing but a walking corpse, and that's when Reg has had enough of her shit and confronts her. But that's when he made the biggest mistake, because Ozen is more god than mortal, and she's about to destroy both of them. She's way stronger than Reg by far, and she challenges him to the death, and Reg does his best, but is no match for Ozen's terror. Reiko comes running to Reg's safety, but is slapped unconscious. Okay, this did not work out so good for them. Ozen is the top white whistle there is and is over half a century old and there's no way that we can beat her being left to die in the abyss years ago. Ozen received one and eventually collected 120,000 men pins artifacts embedded Dude. into her skin. Which That's a lot, bro. Which are first grade artifacts found within the abyss which can enhance the user's strength and longevity tenfold with just a single pin. This is the source of her power and durability and the reason that we can't beat her as easily as we think. If I was Ray, 
big. I'd give up fighting this towering giant lady who could step on us any day and retreat, but not for good. I'd argue that the only way to beat her would be the Hail Mary of a long shot to go find more thousand men pins near the bottom of the fifth layer by visiting the only station where white whistles can venture to within the fifth layer, a forward operating base known as Ido Front. Here I think we'd have our best bet in finding more thousand men pins to collect first before coming back to destroy this towering feminine monstrosity. Or as noted by Riggs Energy Beam, we could try using that as a last ditch attempt, but this could only work if we found some sort of way to surprise Ozen when she would be least prepared, as long as she doesn't know what powers we're capable of just yet. So a surprise attack at a later date may be our only option. As for Rico being stuck there, eh, she'll be fine, she'll be fine. Reg aims his terrifying energy gun at Ozen, preparing to destroy her here and now. But Ozen deflects the ray beam, causing Rake to think fast and aim it upward, blowing a hole in the wall. Reg battles her with all his might, blow after blow, but it's no use. Reg passes out again and wakes up to a crying Rico, along with some cave raiders, who came in after blue-haired girl called them in for help. In a shocking twist, this turns out to be all a twisted test, done by Ozen to test their strength in order to see if they're prepared for the harsh terrain in the abyss that they'll soon encounter. Reg also finds out from Ozen that he passes out every time he uses his laser beam gun for exactly two hours, and that he's almost indestructible, according to Ozen. Ozen then reveals that the grave where Rico's mother is buried is actually empty, and says that Rico's mother is still down there, and this time she's not messing with them. Later, Ozen prepares to whip these kids into shape and leaves them out in the forest, saying that for 10 days in the harsh wilderness, they'll be forced to survive, to show Ozen that they've got what it takes to handle the next few layers within the abyss. Reg and Rico get to work, building a fire and tent and learn the ways of how to survive the harsh wilderness of the abyss. During this process, Ozen and her team keep an eye on them, learning their weaknesses and strengths. Rico and Reg soon learn the ways of this terrifying forest, even managing to capture this gas ghastly looking jungle beast for dinner with some tricks and some traps, learning and preparing for the harsh layers of the abyss that they have yet to face down below. The 10 days finally pass as Rico and Rake make it back to Ozen's camp, all withered and battered by their adventures in the forest. They finally made it. Ozen then welcomes them back with a dinner and reveals to them how the passage of time works differently the deeper in the abyss you go, with months on the surface equating to mere weeks or even days deep with in the abyss. I'm this means that years. Rico is not crazy and that her mother could actually be alive. But Ozen says to watch out for the other white whistles on the fifth layer of the abyss, the deepest layer that humans are currently capable of going to, including the reckless and pure evil white whistle known as the Sovereign of Dawn, Bondrude the Novel. But Ozen thinks that Rico's mother's note is a fake and not actually written by Rico's mother due to the penmanship being overly large and crooked. Okay, we've known for a while now that our mother's note could be a fake, since there's no basis to determine what we're holding is indeed real or not. But Ozen is onto something here. The study of handwriting analysis is a way in which a person's fine motor skills can leave clues about the author's identity, based on a set of predetermined characteristics, which is what forensic experts routinely do. They have to distinguish between style characteristics and individual characteristics, which takes a lot of training, with people at max sharing maybe one or or two similar characteristics, but the possibility of sharing up to 20 to 30 characteristics is virtually impossible. This is the reason why no one's handwriting is exactly the same and can be identified by looking for a wide array of individual traits, from letter form, including the curves, slants, the proportional size of the letters, to line form, including how smooth and dark the lines are, indicating pressure applied, to formatting, including the spacing between letters and words, and the margins a writer leaves empty on a page, and owes and could boy, he put so much detail, boy. He, I like how they break things down. I like that tell all of this from a simple glance, because if Ozen was with Rico's mother for any significant length of time, then she probably could have been able to tell Rico's mother's handwriting. Just what in the world is waiting at the bottom of the netherworld with Rico's mother, Ozen wonders. And this is exactly what Rico aims to find out. Ozen gives them an axe weapon that belonged to Rico's mother, and Ozen heads them off, down into the third lair. Rico and Reg reach an empty, gaping chasm, filled with 
with horrifying winged beasts known as Madoka Jacks. While they look for a way to descend down even further, Reg then grapples another entrance with his hook hands as he descends with Rico, but then hears something terrifying. Something is hunting for them. Reg looks one more time towards the source of the sound, before Rico calls him to explore the cave further with these furballs, after which they reach an abandoned ship stuck in between the rocks and explore it, before Rico steps in something sinister, something that frightens her to her core, as she looks more closely to see skeleton remains. Just then, a Madoka Jack, or let's say MJ, attacks them before Reg saves oh. Rico. This is it. Reg needs to act fast, but he's terrified of passing out after using his blaster. Reg thinks again if he wants to use it, oh. while this monster comes for their flesh. This bad boy means serious business and catches their prey while airborne usually. Honestly, Rico should have seen the signs, or we should have, say, smelt the signs because she stepped in their poop. These creatures aren't exactly the most sanitary of creatures to begin with, and they're nests are usually accompanied by nearby feces that surround the area. And we know from Ozen that Reg is indestructible, but realistically, his winning bet is that energy beam gun of his. So I'd say that why don't we go balls to the wall and jump inside MJ's mouth, sliding down its esophagus and getting cozy from inside the monster itself. Insane thought I know, but Ozen told us that he's indestructible and we can't afford to miss, because hello everybody knows yeah, the- go inside and use the, the blast. Insides of a monster are way softer, we yeah. hope. And we know with near certainty that the monster's bowels won't dissolve us in the acid in the process. Problem solved. Just then, Reg aims his hand and hopes to God that he doesn't miss, and fires his ray beam blaster, decapitating the beast right there. Reg then tells Rico to hide and to be on alert, since Reg knows that he's about to pass out, and Rico prepares herself to take on the horrors without Reg. But just then, another split jaw worm finds them, which forces the duo to run for their life, and turns out that it has injuries on its body, exactly That's where Rig yeah. shot it earlier, meaning that this is the same monster from earlier and that it's been following them. They barely escape with their lives, managing to squeeze through a small shaft just as Reg finally passes out, forcing Rico to be all alone. But Rico being young and ill-equipped for these depths, she decides to explore the cave even further, taking an unconscious Reg with her, exploring the various ventricular shafts that this menacing cave presents to her, but then she suddenly smells something sweet. It's the smell of fruit, and her little tummy is rumbling. Rico runs to trace the source of this smell, but not before she falls right into this hole. But it's no ordinary hole. It's For real. She just got set up. It's filled with animal furball corpses, and it's not a hole, but a stomach. They're inside an amakagame, and its fruit smell was a trap to lure the yep. furballs in, and now it has Rico. But Rico thinks fast and whips out her knife, puncturing a hole right through this yeah, beast's belly. Yeah, that's a good, that's, yeah, she got her fruit up and they quickly expel the creature's innards and are now covered in the scent of fresh fruit. But that's bad news, Bears, because Rico gets up and looks around her and sees nothing but furballs and they're hungry because she smells just like their favorite fruit. So Rico runs for her little life, tugging unconscious Reg along with all her might as she falls and crawls her way out of that horrifying situation. But just then, another split jaw worm pops up right in front of them, ready to eat their young flesh. So Rico quickly hands Reg who is now wide awake, a weapon, and he charges at the worm and defeats it, causing mm. them to barely get out of another life and death situation. The duo exhausted then head off and finally get one step closer to reaching the bottom of the abyss. And now they finally reach the fourth layer. They take refuge in what appears to be a tree surrounded by countless pools of water covered by steam. But then Reg senses something in the atmosphere. Something is watching them. Rico suggests they get the heck out of there, but that's when they see it. The most horrifying monster that they've ever encountered. An orb piercer. Rico and Reg stand paralyzed in fear. So uh, that thing reminds me like, the, like a hedgehog porcupine cat. Bobcat and Rico mentions that they need to run. Armed with quills that can pierce through steel and laced with poison, there's no way that they can fight this orb piercer head on. Reg grabs Rico and runs, but this beast is too quick for them and slices their backpack. They're gonna need a new plan. Turns out their only weapon, given by Ozen, was dropped right next to the orb piercer. The beast then charges at them again, while Rico hands Reg an umbrella-like shield, defending themselves at the last moment until something goes horribly wrong. 
wrong. It's Rico, and she's mm. been stabbed. She then collapses as the poison takes hold of her and is trembling in pain. Reg now knows that he truly can't beat this beast, not yet. And so he whips out his grappling hook and bolts out of there with Rico before the monster can get them. Jeez, this is an orb piercer. These creatures are herbivores by nature, but are fiercely territorial and defensive over their territory. A single orb piercer has taken the lives of over 100 black whistles over the years, and Reg royally underestimated this beast. Now this thing has only one weakness, and that is its face. With this organ being part of their face that senses the force field of the abyss, but they made the mistake in trying to run from the get-go, as it's clear from the ability to sense movement that this beast knew our movements from the beginning, and because of this, Reg and Rico lost their only weapon, their Blaze Reap pickaxe that Ozen gave to them. Instead of running, Reg should have wrapped his first hand around Rico and had her jump off the platform and hang to stay out of harm's way, and then should have waited for the orb piercer to charge at him. Remember, he's likely darn near indestructible, therefore he could have used this orb's piercer momentum to his advantage, waiting for that beast to charge at him before planting his pickaxe deep into its organs near its face, and killing it then and there. But Reg is not out of the woods just yet, because Rico's arm has grown twice in size, and she is mm. dying fast. She begs Reg to amputate her arm, but he gets scared. If he doesn't do this, she will die. Reg finally gets some robotic balls and whips out his knife and begins doing the most horrifying and necessary thing he's ever done, Gotta cutting do off the arm of a little girl. Rico then suddenly passes out, and it looks like she's not breathing, causing Reg to freak out hard. But that's when he sees someone, a weird, fluffy-looking creature named Nanachi, who offers to help them out. Reg doesn't trust her fully, but he has no choice, and begins to follow this strange creature back to her house. At her place, we then find out that Nanachi is a hollow, and over the course of the next few days, Nanachi helps restore Riko back to health, and they, in the process, also meet a strange creature who is also a hollow, a person who was once a human who ascended from the sixth layer long ago, causing them to lose their humanity and turn into a beast. This is what could happen to Riko if they aren't careful down there. Nanachi also shows Reg some new tricks and helps him go back to fight the monster that nearly killed Rico, the Orb Piercer. And they intervene right before this terrifying monster is about to kill this lost explorer. And so Reg, with the help of Nanachi, manages to grab a hold of this beast's organs while shooting his grappling hooks to tie the beast up. And Reg obliterates this beast with the full force of his Ooh. energy beam, causing a massive orb of light to spawn right in front of them, followed by an explosion. And Nanachi's eyes widen in shock and awe. Now he did what we pretty much suggested, just changing it up a little by using his blaster. But we could have been, yet again, a little more clean on our execution, with some bait. Now I'm not saying that we should have used Rico as bait, we shouldn't use Rico as bait. However, she's pretty much already dead, and by ignoring this puny human delver, he found a new companion better equipped to help us on a journey who's also not a tiny 8 year old girl with glasses. Yes, this would be heartless, but her death would be a noble one, and we could use her half-conscious corpse as bait against the orb piercer by laying her down within the orb piercer's territory and waiting for the beast to show up and kill Rico. Then we could come up from behind and take it down with our blaster. Worst case we'd miss, pass out, and the orb monster would try to crush our unconscious body for two hours until we awaken yet again for round two. After seeing Reg's massive energy weapon, Nanachi has one favor to ask him, and that is to kill her beloved hollow friend, this hollow beast. However, Reg's mouth drops open at this shocking request. We then also find out about Nanachi she's past, and that she and this hollow beast friend of hers were part of an experiment conducted by the twisted white whistle, Sovereign of Dawn, Bondrude, the novel, caused by a mad scientist experiments in finding out what happens when someone comes into contact with the curse of the abyss after quickly ascending from the sixth layer, and that this experiment caused Nanachi's beloved best friend to lose her humanity and become this indestructible beast, and forced Nanachi to change her form into what we see now. Reg then thinks that she's alive due to her response in being called by name, but Nanachi says that it's just a brain reflex, and that her hollow friend actually longs to die, but due to her indestructible skin cannot die no matter how hard Nanachi tries. But she thinks that Reg's energy beam is the only thing that has the power to do it, if Reg has the will. The days pass as Rico heals more, and finally, Reg prepares to kill Nanachi's best friend, blasting her into oblivion with pure raw 
power as she and everything else with her evaporate into nothingness. Nanachi then weeps for her best friend, causing Reg to weep as well. He did it, but it's not all bad news, as Riko finally regains consciousness and asks for Nanachi to come with Riko and Reg to find her mom. And now, with nothing holding Nanachi back and Riko fully healed, the gang heads off further into the abyss to find Riko's mother, the cause behind Reg's creation, and to reveal some answers as to the creation of the abyss itself. <laughs>